So today, um, uh, for those of you who are looking at the Zoom screen, and you'll see up in the upper right-hand corner, there's our guest today, Anne Friedman. We're very fortunate that she's made time for us in her very busy schedule. Uh, she's the founder of Planet Word, um, which is a new museum in Washington, D.C. You'll be hearing all about it today and how the change is the moving force behind uh, visualizing it and getting it started. So it's a great accomplishment. Um, we like to think that we partner with other organizations and we're very happy to have Anne agree to come and share her information with us about how she got a brand new in-person museum on language established right in downtown Washington, D.C. So I think I'll leave it at that. Well, All right, great. so take it away, Anne. <laughs> Thank you, Laura, Jill, Greg, you've always been very friendly and helpful to me from uh, the very beginning, and I really appreciate it. So um, I was asked to talk about where the idea came from and, and how I established Planet Word. So I'll do that um, during the first half of my talk, and then devote the second half to really talking about the individual galleries, exhibits, and how we decided on the content uh, that went into them. And I'll, I'll have some slides, uh, especially in the second half of the talk, but only a few uh, in this first presentation. So to tell you the story of how I came to found Planet Word, I need to go back a long way back to ninth grade in Des Moines when a young French woman came to live with my family and tutored me in French in exchange for room and board. And then let's go back to 1970 when I went on the experiment in international living and learned intensive Italian before living with an Italian family in Ascoli Piceno. And then to 1972 when I applied to college and said, I plan to major in linguistics, which is not how things turned out, but that was my plan. Or you could go back to the 1980s when my husband and I lived in Beirut and Jerusalem, two cities torn by civil strife. So after witnessing people not getting along and acting as fellow countrymen, I vowed to myself that when we moved back to the United States, I would do something to create community. So first I tutored illiterate adults. Then I started my own extracurricular arts and craft class on world cultures for children ages five to eight, close to the ages of my own kids at the time. And that class, which I named world class, was really popular, especially the part at the end of each session when the kids got to eat food from the different cultures they were learning about. So they rolled sheets of seaweed and uh, made their own sushi, or uh, they um, tried gulab jamun when we learned about India. So after three years of teaching this world class, I decided I should become a real certified teacher. And I returned to graduate school for a master's in teaching. So in my 40s, I became a public school teacher in Montgomery County, Maryland. Teaching in the public schools was a, an intentional choice because I saw public schools as one of the few remaining institutions that brought Americans of all walks of life together, especially now that there was no universal draft in America. I started out teaching fifth grade but for most of my teaching career, I taught beginning reading and writing in first grade. And that was not what I thought I'd enjoy, but I found it, I absolutely loved teaching children to read, introducing them to literature and poetry and the English language, to word play and persuasive writing, diagnosing reading difficulties, finding material that suited each child's interests. So I built up a huge library too of, of books and resources. I'd worked as a translator and copy editor in my previous jobs overseas and in the US. 
So working with words was always something that I'd done. In 2011, I retired from teaching and looked for something else to do on a volunteer basis that would keep me in the literacy field. Knowing how important good reading skills were to someone's future, I was worried about the state of literacy in the US. It's worried for our democracy, which relies on a literate population. At the time, an estimated 30% of all adults were said to be functionally illiterate. That meant that they had trouble reading a medicine label or a recipe. Reading test scores were stagnating. Young people were hardly reading a book a year for pleasure, according to surveys. Newspapers and magazines were folding, and there were all sorts of other entertainment options for people. You didn't have to pick up a book and read to entertain yourself anymore, to say the least. So I thought we needed to come up with some new ideas. Obviously, schools and reading teachers like me weren't the answer. Parents weren't the answer. We had to do something to encourage reading, to create a buzz around reading, to make it cool, to make words awesome. So while I was considering my options and trying different opportunities, I happened to read a story in the New York Times, and this was in 2012 or 13, about a new museum in New York, MoMath, the National Museum of Mathematics. The museum was using lots of interactive hands-on exhibits and technology to bring the abstract concepts of math to life. Hmm, I thought, maybe that's what I should do, use technology to bring words to life. After all, I believed, words and reading were so much more important to sustaining democracy than numbers. In fact, I'd heard a, a lecture by Dana Joya, the former head of the NEA, where he cited a survey they'd done in 2004, and it found that readers were much more likely to be volunteers, to be active in their communities, and to vote. Not to mention, Good readers were more likely to do well in school, to graduate from high school and go to college, to make a higher salary, and to have the advanced vocabulary that you need to solve and vote on complex issues nowadays. Also, reading leads to the skills of critical thinking and analysis that we want voters to have. So maybe a museum of words was my answer. Museums excel at informal education. They try to make learning fun by showing and not telling. That was an approach that spoke to me. But <laughs> just one problem, I didn't know anything about creating a museum. I was a teacher. So I started reading everything I could find on museum theory. One of the influential books that I read at the time was called The Participatory Museum by Nina Simons. I really was taken by her examples of museums that were involving the community. And I started also reaching, researching linguistics because I knew about education and literacy but I didn't have a background in linguistics, although I'd studied several languages. And then I started traveling around the country, visiting museums that might be models for a museum focused on reading or communication and, and using technology. I went to the Tech Museum in San Jose, the Exploratorium in San Francisco, the Strong Museum, that's um, the National Museum of Play in Rochester, New York. The Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. The Liberty Science Center in New Jersey. 
And last but not least, Mundo Lingua in Paris. The latter was a pure linguistics museum. And I absolutely loved this tiny, intimate, quirky museum, but I knew its low tech approach was not what I had in mind. It wouldn't turn reluctant readers into word lovers because if you visit there, you'll see that you have to do a lot of reading of labels and you know it, it expects the people who are visiting to already be avid readers and to know a lot about words and language. However, it's amazing collection of linguistics content had to form at least part of the museum I wanted to found. So I wanted people to experience words and language, to learn by doing. I wanted the museum to show and not tell. I didn't want anyone to say, oh, I don't wanna visit Planet Word because I don't like reading. I wanted the museum to welcome anybody not to be intimidating and to sort of meet visitors where they were. I didn't want any barriers to entry. So that also meant that the museum had to be free if at all possible, and it is free. My next step was hiring a museum consultant to help me understand whether my idea could fly at all. Words I came to believe uh, were the overlooked, underappreciated artifacts of our time. I didn't intend for the experiential museum I had in mind to have a collection, but I realized that actually you could say we are all collectors of our words from the day we are born. We all know and amass a highly personal set of words that we use every day that say a lot about who we are and where we come from. It was about time I thought that people noticed those little artifacts and came to understand their power, their beauty, and the fun they could have with words. We needed to create a new, more positive disposition toward words. So um, this feasibility study was, was done. It's like a 90 page document and it came back really positive. So I knew what I had in my head for a museum of words and language, but I decided to see what regular people would think about the idea. We conducted four focus groups, two of 10 to 12 year olds and two of their parents. And we asked the participants what they would think about a place where X happened. We didn't say that this place, what this place would be. We didn't call it a museum or anything. We just tried to be as vague as possible, but give a some, you know, some kind of idea of the things that you would do in this place. And it was just incredible. The 10 to 12 year old boys, they got so excited and they shouted out, but you're talking about a word museum. And so they really got it. They understood my intentions and the possibilities. And so, you know, that was all I really needed to hear. And in fact, the facilitator of the focus group said that in her 25 years in the business, she had never heard such an enthusiastic response to any idea. So I was sort of like, okay, there is no turning back now. I need to keep pursuing this idea. And um, also at the focus groups, the name Planet Word was born. The focus group participants love that name because they said words are universal, they're everywhere. And 
I really like that name too, because I wanted a name that indicated a place, a physical location. I wanted the museum to be a place where people would gather to use their words to talk to one another. So with this positive energy, I applied to the IRS for nonprofit status, formed a governing board of people with knowledge of museum education, of real estate, of law, of finance, of marketing and communications, and of technology. Those were the areas that I thought I would need help, you know, need expertise in order to create a museum of the type I had in mind. So I had to set to work. And um, at the same time, I also started putting together an advisory board of people in word related fields, people who could vet ideas and also, you know, give me credibility because they had credibility in their fields. Since I was neither a linguist, a wordsmith, a lyricist, a poet, or an author, I needed some of those people on the advisory board. So finding a home for the museum was a lot tougher than uh, putting together a board or an advisory board. I'd always assumed that I'd rent a commercial space. Despite the fact that my museum consultant said, oh no, you, you will never be able to afford to afford a commercial rent if you really intend to have a free museum. So I kind of thought, mm, I need to find something with a like sort of a special situation. So when an RFP, a request for proposals came up for the Franklin School in about 2015, I decided to go and look at it. But it was in terrible disrepair. Just like falling apart, full of lead paint flakes, not safe for people to be in, police caution tape on the stairs, uh, holes in the floor, anyway. So not only did this look like a real dump, but I never had intended to renovate a building. I didn't know anything about that, and let alone a 150 year old building. And I also thought it was too small for the museum that I wanted to create. It didn't have any outdoor area. And I had always planned to have a prepositional playground at Planet Word. And so without outdoor space, there would be no playground. But I had had to sign in that I came to tour the Franklin School. And the people at the deputy mayor's office in the district and in their real estate department saw that I'd signed in and knew what I was trying to do. And they really liked my perspective use for the school because it was so aligned with the history of the building, place of learning, you know, former school, and, the, and also the site of a milestone in the history of technology. And for those of you who don't know, um, the school opened in 1869 and it was co-ed and it's a national historic landmark just because of its innovative architecture. But also it became a, a national historic landmark for the second time because in 1880, Alexander Graham Bell successfully conducted an experiment from somewhere up on the rooftop or somewhere at the top of Planet Word to send a message using light waves. And that was something he invented and called the photophone. And he actually said, that he considered the photophone 
a more important invention than the telephone, which he also invented. So he, he knew, he was very prescient that this invention of a precursor to wireless was his most important in invention. And it happened right here at the Franklin School. So then I decided I had to hire a design firm to analyze whether the Franklin School was actually big enough to house the museum I had in mind. And it turned out that it's 36,000 square feet of usable space was actually just enough for the museum I had in mind for exhibit galleries, a gift shop, a restaurant, an auditorium, event spaces, offices, and classrooms. Therefore, I decided to respond to the RFP and ended up being awarded a 99 year lease for $10 a year in return for promising to restore this National Historic Landmark. So now I'm going to try to share my screen and show you some photos of the building. So there it is. There is the Franklin School in all its glory. Uh, it was designed by the architect Adolf Kloos, who was known as a master of brick. And there are several buildings still existing in Washington that were designed by Clues and their red brick, um, the arts and industries and a couple other schools. Most of his buildings don't exist anymore, but um, you can see that uh, rounded arch style that he brought from his native Germany. He believed that poor children should be able to go to school in as beautiful a place as rich children. And so the Franklin School was actually a, a co-ed public school in the 1860s. And he also believed that a lot of light and air circulation enhanced education. And so the windows are very tall, the ceilings are really high, and the shafts at the corners of the building bring to this day still bring in fresh air from outside into the building. Next slide. Well, that's what the building looked like when I got the lease. So you can see what a daunting prospect that was. Um, I'll show a couple more slides of the, the interiors that were really a mess. One day I visited and it was raining inside the museum, raining outside and raining inside. And so we started with hazmat abatement in April of 2018 and the renovation restoration took about two and a half years. Simultaneously, I did a search for an executive director, knowing that I needed a real museum professional by my side. And I immediately knew that Patty Isaacson Sabi, who had been the executive director of Mopop in Seattle for 10 years, was just the person I needed. And the fact that we were both from Iowa, not to mention she had gone to Grinnell College, my mother's and my grandfather's alma mater, made it seem like the stars were aligned. And here are some of the beautiful original details of the Franklin School, what Clues had used to make this a beautiful space for learning. Uh, most of the trim and the details are cast iron, and you can see the beautiful ceramic tile and marble floors, which we restored and are there. And when you visit, you will see them. 
So I set up a private development company to lead the restoration of the building. And the board, the governing board led our nonprofit Museum of Language Arts, which I, is what I incorporated as. And the governing board and I raised the funds to pay for the museum exhibit design and fabrication. We worked on the exhibit design and restoration of the school simultaneously in hopes that we could open by May 31st, 2020. But you know how that story ended. The pandemic hadn't ended even when we did open, which was on October 22nd, 2020, but we did decide to open anyway. And why did we do that? We were ready. The exhibits were installed and the building restoration was complete. Staff was on our payroll. But for me, the number one reason why I wanted our Museum of Words and Language to be open and make a case for using words to heal and not to harm, for good and not for ill, before the election in November of 2020. In the face of a president who encouraged untruths, who bullied and belittled, who questioned the trustworthiness of media, who twisted words and deprived them of meaning, all those factors meant that I had to open Planet Word. It had to be a place that stood for the opposite, that would encourage civil dialogue and critical thinking, mm -hmm. whose exhibits were based on science and fact. An insurrection on January 6th and the continued propagation of the big lie confirms our decision to go ahead. What it meant was that we had to have a virtual opening celebration. We had to limit visitors to 35 people per hour. We had to switch our programs and field trips to, to being online, just like the National Museum of Language, instead of in-house, and to operate without revenue from the event rentals that we'd counted on. But we made it and we've actually thrived and we're now seeing signs of life with field trips starting up, event rentals in all our spaces and gift shop purchases soaring. Here's a picture of a wedding uh, ceremony that was held on the fourth floor, a new event space that we created out of the former attic. And here's a picture of a little corner of our gift shop where we sell word related things, items, books, puzzles, games, and it's been very popular. So I'm gonna pause here for questions. And then after we finish the Q and A and after the break, I'll be glad to tell you about the exhibit design process the thought that went into determining the museum's content. And I'll show you pictures of our voice activated, 100% experiential and interactive museum that's now been operating for just a few days, more than a year. So thank you very much. And I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Uh, I see uh, Eileen has a, a hand raised. Um, well, and there was a and question. Go ahead. I just wanted to thank you. I mean, I've been, I got to Planet Word as soon as it opened and it exceeded my wildest imaginings, <laughs> the extraordinariness of it. It really is. Um, um, you know, I know uh, Colin and so I talked to him about it, but I, I, there's no way to appreciate what it is unless you go there. There aren't Thank any you. words to describe it. <laughs> and so my question to you is, following your, your, your train of thinking still, this is such an audacious project. And so just trying to fathom 
how you were able to go from having this idea to thinking about all the different pieces that are involved and all the the economics of it and you know it just it it, it seems extraordinary and i um just would love to hear more about that from you thank you um thank you so much i'm glad that you visited and had a a really good time um I think that when you're doing something day to day and you're just sort of overwhelmed, solving problems, tackling things that have to get done, you don't think about how it might look to other people as like crazy. Um, you know, I had so many really smart, talented people who first reacted positively to the idea and then second helped me and I'll talk about the exhibit design firm in the second part of the talk but their creativity and genius really combined with my kernels of ideas to to make the success that you know the successful outcome that I think we've achieved um, you know, and it was also just like every time there was a problem, find somebody who could help, who might have an answer, you know, and that was everybody from my brother, who's a real estate developer to, you know, Patty, our executive director, who just knew everything about running a museum. And so I had professional knowledgeable people who loved words that I could turn to all the time. But you know, you mentioned Colin Phillips and he's um, the head of the Language Science Center at the University of Maryland. He was so influential in guiding me and how this museum turned out because I didn't realize that linguistics was such a multidisciplinary field. You know, it never occurred to me. And then I, I met Colin and he told me how the Language Science Center brings together 12 departments at the University of Maryland. And that means engineering and computer science and neuroscience and, you know, not just comparative literature or English or linguistics, um, but that opened a huge uh, sort of window to me that allowed me to stretch the concept of a museum of words and language to all these other fields that made the, a museum on such a broad topic much more rational and interesting. So I owe a lot to, to just you know, I just called up Phil, uh, Colin because his name was given to me and, you know, got started being educated in what linguistics really means and how many fields it touches. And um, so very important. Did I answer the your last, question? Oh, absolutely. The last, the last piece I will say is I immediately knew the museum was a hit when teenagers we're just bouncing all over the place with excitement. I mean, that's that's the most exciting thing you could see, and um, and it just draws people in organically. And I just can't say enough good things about it. So I am so grateful for your vision and your ability to implement and your wisdom to know how to work with the wise, the smart, and the resourceful. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of people who are way smarter and everything than me and I'm not ashamed to admit it. <laughs> so. And there was also a question about 12 year old girls in the uh, focus group or 10 to 12 year old girls. Uh, I think Elizabeth had that question as well. They, as, uh, they, they went off on tangents like, well, could there be fashion design in a museum of words and language? And so they kept coming up with subjects that were of interest to them. 
And no, we don't have any fashion design, but you know, we could have a lecture on the language of fashion design or something like that in our auditorium. And indeed, Dion von Furstenberg and her husband, Barry Diller, are the donors, um, are the, uh, the people who gave us the funding for our very most important gallery called Words Matter. And that's because Dion, when she met me once, and I, you know, she asked me what I was doing and I told her about this museum idea. She said, oh, I love words. I'm writing a book. And so we became friends and her ideas about words actually made a big impact on how that gallery and the um, activities in that gallery were developed. So, um, you know, here's a fashion designer <laughs> connected to the museum, not in the way those little girls expected, but, um, and then, you know, uh, eventually came to um, know that teenage girls are the biggest inventors of new words um, in English throughout history. You know, everybody thinks it's Shakespeare or something but actually it's teenage girls who have shaped a lot of the changes in our language over time. 